All right. This is, this is the second to last Wednesday in our Ask the Pastor two months. So next week we might have some trivia. We might have some good questions for you to answer. Hopefully you've been paying attention. All right. So tonight, this kind of goes with what we talked about last Wednesday when we were talking about um, the church, uh, Jews and Gentile, one in Christ being grafted into the olive tree. Um, Israel was the olive tree. This was God's plan from the beginning, and we are grafted in, and so he broke off some branches, and so he's going to be able to graft the Israel back in again. And so we talk about the different types of covenants and so forth that God gave Israel. And so uh, the question is, did, did Israel replace the ch- or did the church replace Israel or uh, is Israel the church? And so all these questions come up and there's that replacement theology and so forth. Uh, so we talked about that last time. But tonight I want to go into the covenants and, and to show you um, God's plan. We, uh, we are partially covenant theologians. But we don't deal with all the covenants because that deals with Israel, God's people. We're not quite dispensationalists. Uh, I'd probably line more with dispensationalism than I would covenant theology. But dispensationalism can be taken out of context. Don't get caught up on these two terms. Uh, Don't get caught up in the definitions. Don't get caught up in any of that stuff uh, because we just believe what the Bible says. Does that make sense? You believe what God says and keep moving on. But then people build doctrines and they have all this separation stuff and you gotta you gotta be careful with what you're what you're talking about. So I want to explain the covenant theology, but I wanted to throw dispensationalism out to you because it is a term uh, more recent, probably in the latter 1800s, we come up with this term dispensationalism. I'll give the definition of terms in just a moment. Uh, but you got to be careful with that because a dispensation is a period of time where God um, tests man and it ends in his failure. And so what has happened is, uh, for the most part, there's only seven dispensations, but there's upwards around 37, and people keep adding to them, and then they create new ones. And so uh, you just you got to be careful with some of that stuff. So don't get too engrossed in, in these type of terms. I want to give them to you and get a little more in depth uh, of what God has given throughout the history of the Bible and how that applies to us as far as being grafted into Israel and so forth, and we can do some explanations. Define your terms. We talk about covenant. What is a covenant? An agreement between two parties, right? There you go. An agreement between two parties that you are going to perform some type of action. Right? That's a covenant. Uh, Actually, the word testament is really synonymous with covenant. And so when you talk about the two parts of the Bible, you have the old covenant and the new covenant, or the old testament and the new testament. Um, So both of those are are kind of uh, interchangeable. Uh, A covenant was a well known concept in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, especially in ancient times. It was two equal parties, uh, something like a king and a subject. And so the covenant would go something like the king would promise certain protections for the people, and then the people in turn in that covenant would promise their loyalty to the king. So as long as the king was doing his part, uh, the people were doing their part, then they uh, had the covenant was agreeable. But biblically speaking, a covenant can be a conditional or an unconditional so there may be a condition on that, or it may be unconditional. It may not have to do with that. And so we'll talk a little bit about those as we go along. Dispensation or dispensationalism is defined as this. It's a method of interpreting history that divides God's work and purposes towards mankind into different periods of time. And, and I've got one example in our covenants uh, but I'm not going to get a, uh, if we have time at the end, I can give you all the different dispensations. But uh, anyway, we'll just stick with uh, our covenant theology. Usually there are seven dispensations that go along with the seven uh, covenants of God. So let's get into all of these covenants. 
And if you have any questions about any covenant before we move forward, uh, we will answer those questions. Pam. Can you rephrase that again, the definition? I didn't get all that. Of which? The definition of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is a method of interpreting history that divides God's work and purposes towards mankind into different periods of time. Or if you want a simple definition, it's a time period in history. History. That's West Virginia talk for... <laughs> a time in history where God tests man and it ends in his failure. For the most part. Did you get that definition I give you on the first one? Awesome. All right, let's get into it. First one, the Edemic Covenant. What is the Edemic Covenant? Okay. It deals with Adam, yes. Okay, so the Edemic Covenant, this is God's directive regarding the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So when you go back to Genesis, the Edemic Covenant, it included the curses that were pronounced as a result uh, against the sin of Adam and Eve and the serpent. Uh, and it also talked about God's provision uh, for what happened in Genesis 3, verse 15. And so uh, when we talk about dispensationalism, this is called the dispensation of innocence. Adam and Eve were created innocent of any wrongdoing. And so this period of time ended when they failed. And so as soon as they sinned, the dispensation of innocence was over, and so it moved on. So the Edemic Covenant, God said what? Deals with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can have everything but this. Don't eat this tree. If you eat of this tree, what's going to happen? You're going to die. Okay, so was this a conditional or unconditional covenant? It was conditional. Okay, so this covenant was conditional. God said, here's a perfect environment. Here's Eden. I've created everything. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Genesis 1, 30 and 31 says that it was very good, but don't touch this tree. And so, based on, and this correlates with the dispensation of innocence, they were innocents of all wrongdoing, had a perfect environment, but they chose to disobey. Um, and so because they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, now there's curses that come upon women. What happened to women? Two. Pain and childbirth. What's the second? Yes, fighting between spouses. That's a good way to look at it. Um, men and women are created equal. Uh, Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, or male or female. You're all one in Christ. But there is a, an authority in the home, and God says it's man, but women are going to struggle to try to lead, and that's unbiblical. Um, and you could look at it this way. They're like, oh, well, um, women were always put down. Yes, because they didn't look at the Trinity of God. Is God the Father God? Is Jesus Christ God? Is God the Holy Spirit God? Okay, does the Holy Spirit have to submit to Jesus and God the Father? Yeah? Did Jesus have to submit to God the Father? But isn't Jesus God? Okay, so there's an authority issue there. And that's the same thing with men and women. Men and women are created equal. They are equal on every part. But as far as the home, God has placed man as the authority. That's the only difference. So, here you have the Edemic Covenant. Do not touch this tree. It's conditional. They failed in their condition. Now there's consequences. M women have childbirth, and they want to lead the home. What happened to men? Toil in their labor. By the sweat of their brow, they're going to they're gonna work all the days of their life till they return to dust. That's something to look forward to, isn't it? Yes. I work till I become dust again. Woohoo! That's so great. What was the other curse? Well, that was on the serpent. Men only had one? Did you say the ground was cursed yet? Oh. 
Well, you could say, oh, I guess I, I probably sucked you into that one too. Man is going to, by the sweat of his brow, is he going to work all the days of his life? But the earth is now cursed as well. And so he's going to work a cursed ground. And so he's going to have problems. Um, so yes, and then of course the serpent. What was the curse of the serpent? Slither on his belly all the days of his life. Uh, and his head would be bruised. Okay, this is the promise of Jesus coming. This is the first promise of a Savior in the Edemic Covenant. Um, he will, you will... Uh, bruise his heel and he will crush your head. So the ideology is there. If, if a serpent was to bite you on the heel, you would recover from it. It's not that big of a deal. But a snake, uh, the serpent, the thinnest portion of his skeleton is right at the top of his head. And so any crushing blow there would kill him. And so that was the idea. It was the first picture of Jesus coming to destroy the works of Satan. Pretty awesome, huh? Okay. That's the Edemic Covenant. So if you ever hear that, that's what that is. It is a covenant with God to the first man, and it was conditional, and it ended when they failed. Make sense? All right, moving on. Number two, we have the Noic Covenant. What is the Noic Covenant? God saved Noah and his family from the flood. Was this conditional or unconditional? Conditional in a way because he had to build the ark. And conditional he had to preach righteousness because that's what Peter says in the New Testament. He was a preacher, a preacher of righteousness. So he had to do something in order to obey, but God still was going to save him anyway. Saved eight people, Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives. And so this is an unconditional covenant between God and Noah, uh, basically for humanity as well. After the flood, God promises that he will not destroy mankind again by flood. What did he leave as a promise? A rainbow. And so is that to show us or is that to show God? It's to remind God. It does. Read Genesis chapter 9 when he comes out. He says, I will put a rainbow that will remind me that I will never destroy mankind by flood again. And this will be as a reminder to me. No, you haven't read that? Okay, I'm just checking. So you can go back there and do that. <laughs> Different verse. What's that? Well, it does add another question. So we see in the Noah covenant that God judged the world. He judged the world because of sin. It had gotten so bad in Genesis 6. God said, I'm going to destroy all mankind, except for eight people. It's pretty crazy. So let me ask you a question. Since we're on this, this is a little side note. Genesis 6, you know the sons of God took the daughters of men and had this Nephilim, created this Nephilim uh, race uh, of whatever. Most people say that those were angels, and that's okay, that's fine. So, did those angels, who people say created a new race of giants, Nephilim, did they have any actions with Noah and his family? Well, yeah, I'm not talking about Hollywood. Exactly. They didn't have any children on the ark. So it's just Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, and they had no children. And they were on the ark for over a year. So it wasn't until after they got off the ark that they began to reproduce. It would remove all doubt. So the sons of God didn't take the daughters of Noah and his wives or any of the well, his, his, so they couldn't have done anything to them. If it was angels creating a new race, why is there still Nephilim after the flood? Because there was giants in the days of Dan, uh, David. That's why I picked up five stones, because Goliath had four other brothers, right? You know the story about that? 
And the brook, he didn't take one stone to kill Goliath. He took five. Because after he was going to take care of Goliath, he was going after his four brothers <laughs> who were just as big. The one had, what, 13 fingers or something or toes or uh, I forget the whole story. But yeah, there's a bunch of them. <laughs> it could be. Could be. Well, we even have giants today. What's that in the Ripley's, believe it or not, that one guy that was nine foot something? They have this people all over the place. So, all right. So that's the Noahic covenant, unconditional, because when God judged sin, he promised that he was not going to judge the world again by flood. Even though we have local floods, it doesn't contradict God's judgment uh, on mankind. Matter of fact, because we have local floods, proves that the flood was a global flood. Because God said, I'm not going to destroy mankind by flood again, by a global flood. Even though tsunamis and so forth, floods uh, take a lot of people's lives. All right, what's the third one? Anybody know the third covenant? This is the big one. Be after the flood? The Abrahamic. We're going in order from Genesis all the way through. <laughs> so the Abrahamic covenant, we know this is a covenant between um, God and Abraham. Uh, many things were given to him. And this was a conditional or unconditional? Unconditional. Why is it unconditional? Because of the nature of all the promises God gave to Abraham. And because of that, when he separated the animal and laid each half of the animal on the side, only God walked through the blood. Abraham fell asleep. Do you remember that? From Je No? Should we go back and read all that? Are you sleeping on me? You read it? I read it because I was looking for eight. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about last week you weren't here. Um, the, it is not spoken of. Nobody knows why. It's tradition. The Old Testament Jews wrote down in the Talmud, uh, which is their oral tradition, and they documented all those things. Um, and that's why everybody knows that the covenant, the Jewish covenant, was done in a figure eight. Um, it is the sign, like uh, Tim said last time, of infinity. Um, but there's no reason why they would do the figure eight. So, uh, I don't know. So that's a good question. Let's ask God when we get up there. So there's a number of things in the Abrahamic covenant. One, personally, God promised that he would make his name great. Genesis 12, 2. God said, I'm going to make your name great. Unconditional. God was the one that was going to do it. Second, Abraham would have numerous physical descendants. Genesis 13, 16. And that he would be the father of a multitude of nations. That's why he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. What does Abraham, uh, his name mean? Father of nations. <laughs> there you go. Good job. So... We see that uh, that was a promise, unconditional, given by God to Abraham. Why? Why was it unconditional on Abraham's part from God? Because he was a hundred-year-old fart. How could he have? How could he have more babies at that age? So anyway, that was the miracle. God promised. It was unconditional. <laughs> All right, third, God also promised regarding the nation of Israel would come from Abraham. Um, and so he's going to call this nation from him. In fact, there's a geographical boundaries to the nation, to the land that God was going to give this nation. And I want you to see this because this is part of the... Can I go in? Um, yeah, this will go into the next promise, but another provision for the Abrahamic covenant is uh, that the families of the world will be blessed, and that's how we're going to be blessed, was that Jesus was to come through the Abrahamic line all the way down through to the Messiah that was promised in Genesis 3.15. Uh, so all the nations of the world will be blessed through salvation in Jesus who would come from Abraham, from Abraham's line, the true line. Um, not from 
Ishmael, but from Isaac. Uh, and that's important to know because that goes back to Palestine and the Muslims and all that stuff today. It's two sons fighting over dad's land, but it was given to Isaac, not Ishmael. This is a map of, well, you see Africa over here. Here's Egypt. Um, over here is Saudi Arabia. And of course, um, up over here is modern day Turkey. And then you have, you know, Greece and Rome over this way. But here, if you can see this right here, this is modern day, well, you call it Palestine, I guess. It should be Israel. Right here is Jerusalem. And so here's the Mediterranean Sea. But this is all of Israel. Here's the Gaza Strip right here. This is what modern day Israel is. But if you go back through in Genesis 15, 18 through 21, God gives you the promised land map layout, which is this right here. This is all the land that God promised them. So the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. God said, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your descendants. as the, If you can count the stars of the sky, that's how many descendants you're going to have. Um, you're going to be a big nation. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you. And you're going to have a promised land. Now, I set this promised land up here because... When you come to the fourth one, which is, they call it the Palestinian covenant. That's a new word because Palestine wasn't used in the Old or New Testament. That's what it's called now. You could call it the land covenant if you want to. This is Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 29, and chapter 30, 1 through 10. And so the Palestinian or the land covenant amplifies the uh, aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. But according to the terms of this covenant, if people disobeyed, uh, God would cause them to be scattered, but he would eventually bring them back. Uh, and so when the, when the nation was restored and they would obey God, God's command perfectly, uh, God would cause them to prosper. And this goes into the millennium. Uh, so the Palestinian covenant is not dependent on Israel's obedience. We'll talk about uh, differently when we get to the Mosaic Covenant because that was dependent on their obedience. The land covenant was not dependent on their obedience. It was an unconditional covenant. And so God said, when you disobeyed, I'm going to scatter you, but I will bring you back. And so God had promised to give them the land, and he's going to, and he will, and they will prosper. So this is a different covenant that only deals with the nation of Israel. Does the Abrahamic Covenant deal only with the nation of Israel? No, because it deals with all people. Because all nations of the world be blessed through him. Does the Noahic covenant deal with only the nation of Israel? No, because it's an unconditional promise that God said he's not going to destroy the world by flood. Okay, so the Edemic covenant, does that apply to everybody? Yes, because we're in effect part of that, right? Sure, because we're under the curse as well. So yes, he was our representative. So yes, that one was for us as well. In Ezekiel 16, 60, it talks about the land covenant. God said, yet I will remember my covenant, the land covenant, with you in the days of your youth. This is Old Testament, Genesis. And I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. So he's like, I promised you the land. And when I give it back to you in the millennium, you're going to have it forever. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. I'm going to fulfill my promise. And this goes back to Romans 11. Remember we're talking about Israel and people think that God's done with Israel and the church has replaced them and all that. And Paul's like, no, God's not done with Israel. They are the olive tree. We are the wild olive tree. And we're grafted into that. And we're partakers of all that stuff. But God isn't done with the olive tree, the one that was natural. And so Romans eleven twenty five through 26, it says, Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What's the fullness of the Gentiles? Anybody know what the fullness of the Gentiles is? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Say that again. 
um, the last member of the church. Yeah, pretty much. The times of the Gentiles ends at what? The rapture of the church. Exactly. But you are 100% correct. But it may be a Jew that gets saved who is part of the church, Jew and Gentile, one in Christ, right? So that's the wild branches that are uh, put back into the, the natural olive tree. Uh, so if a Jew is saved today, he's not part of Israel, he's part of the church. So the times of the Gentiles, which is now, is the church age. And that's what we fall under. And so this will continue on until, boom. Uh, but once the time of the Gentiles has come in, in this way, all Israel will be saved as is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So it's talking about the tribulation period. They'll recognize they crucified their Messiah. Some of the Jews will get saved. Uh, Zechariah talks about uh, two-thirds will not be saved. One-third will be. And then Jesus comes back, boom, kicks off the millennium, and we go into a, a kingdom reign. Number five, Mosaic Covenant. Deuteronomy chapter 11. This is the Mosaic Covenant was conditional. This is a conditional promise that either brought God's blessing or it brought God's cursing upon the nation or punishment, I guess you could say, uh, for disobedience. And it was for all of the world. Was it for all the world? The Mosaic Covenant, was it for all the world? How many of you say no? Okay. Why do you say no? Because it had to do with the law. Okay. What about the law? The law was for the Jews, specifically the nation of Israel. And if they obeyed it, they got blessed. If they disobeyed it, they were cursed. Okay. So if they disobeyed the law, what was the punishment? Well, for most of it. I guess some of it, you could just do a, a blood sacrifice for animal and you were okay. But most of those, like um, uh, adultery, uh, if you're committed adultery, uh, what was the punishment? Death. Okay, this is why Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law, but I've come to fulfill it. So everything that happens, the penalty was put on Jesus. So the law is still in effect, right? But it's fulfilled in Jesus. But you're correct. The law was written for the Jews, specifically the nation of Israel, except for the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, right? Do the Ten Commandments still apply today? You better believe it. Why? Come on. It has to do with the nature of God. It does show us we need a Savior. It was a tutor to point us to Jesus. But the Ten Commandments gives us the character and the nature of God, right? God is holy. You have no other gods before God. And, and the idea there, if you look in the context, is have no other gods before him. Like laying something down before God, that's what it means. Have no other gods before God. Don't lay anything down before God. Um, God comes first. And so everything dealt with the holiness of God. And so what does Peter say in 1 Peter? We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are to be holy because he is holy. So do the Ten Commandments still apply to us today? They certainly do. And if you know Ezekiel chapter 30, you'll find out that God said, I will give you my spirit and I will cause you through my spirit for you to be obedient. You'll be obedient to my commands. That's how we can be holy is because we have the Holy Spirit within us. When you're filled with the spirit, walk in the spirit, you get it right. And you display God's holiness. It still applies today, but it was for the nation of Israel. Because the, the blessings and cursings, there were 300 positive and 300 negative. And so there were like 600 different commands God gave. Um, something that does not apply to the church. We talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago. Circumcision. That was part of the covenant sign for Abraham. Right? Right? Established in Moses. Everybody had to be circumcised. That's why they kept the law of Moses, because you have to be circumcised. Does not apply to people today. That's part of the old covenant for the nation of Israel. There's still some aspects that are for us. And yes, the law, the law points you that you need a Savior. Absolutely. 
And so the historical books from Joshua to Esther, it shows you all through that time all of the obedience and disobedience of Israel. And so God punished them or he blessed them. He punished them or he blessed them. He punished them or he blessed them. And we see all of those things. Next one, this deals with the Davidic covenant. What is the Davidic covenant? Has to do with King David. What did God promise David? There will be a king on the throne always. So God is a liar. Is there a king on the throne in Israel? <laughs> there sure is. He shed innocent blood so he could build the temple. He wanted to build a temple, but because he was a man of blood, God said, no, your son will build it. But he had all the materials ready for him. <laughs> he got that far. So just because there's no king in Israel doesn't mean that God's a liar. Um, the kingdom is going to be restored. And when the kingdom is restored, it is going to be from someone who is from the lineage of Jesus. Or, uh, I'm sorry, David. <laughs> and so that's the Davidic promise. God said that I'm going to establish your kingdom and somebody from your descendants is going to be on the throne that that will last forever. It doesn't say that he's going to, the kingdom will last from now and ever. He said when he sits on the throne, it will be from then forever. So it's an eternal throne that will be established at some point in the future from a descendant of Jesus. Now, did the New Testament proclaim that man was born? Yes, yes or no? Yes. What gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? Pick one. <laughs> Luke, good call. Luke chapter 1, 31 to 33. Luke writes, And behold, you will conceive in your womb, and you'll bear a son. You'll call his name Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. They knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the king that was promised to come. There you go. So just because he came to die for them the first time, they missed it. Even the disciples in Acts chapter 1 said, at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <laughs> they missed his first coming. And so they're waiting. They're still waiting his first coming as far as the nation is concerned right now. Uh, but the ones that believed in Jesus as their Messiah, they're waiting for him to come back now. That's the Davidic covenant. Conditional or Unconditional. Unconditional, because that's just up to God. Did he keep his promise? Yes, the king was born. Is the kingdom yet? No, it's going to be in the future. Is that for the nation of Israel owner only or for everybody? Everybody. How are we partakers of the Davidic kingdom? We're grafted in. We're going to be part of that eternal kingdom. So then I guess my question to you is, well, no, I guess we don't have to worry about that. Are we going to be ruling in any aspect of this land? Didn't God promise that we were going to be ruling there? This land is whose? In this land, your land? And this land is my land? From California all the way to the Middle East? No? Okay, that is only the nation of Israel. So if we're going to rule and reign with Jesus, where are we going to rule and reign from? Why not here in America, where we're at? Sure. Yeah, wherever God says. But it's not going to be here. Why is it not going to be there? Because that's specifically for the Jews. So even though we are part of the eternal kingdom, 
And when Jesus establishes that after his second coming and he goes into the millennial reign, starting that kingdom, yes, that is going to be the Jews' land. They're going to be regathered there. That's why this line is so big and goes way out because all those saved Jews and the ones that get their eternal um, glorified body at the second coming, when we go into the millennium, there's going to be a lot of Jews and they're going to occupy this land. And they are the ones that are going to rule and reign there. You're going to have 12 seats, like the New Jerusalem when it comes down, and the New Heaven and New Earth. Uh, it, it's got um, 24, actually. 12 are from the patriarchs, the 12 tribes of Israel. And the other 12 are from who? The 12 apostles. And who were they? Jew or Gentile? Jew. That's all Jew. All Jews are going to be ruling there. Jew and Gentile, but the Gentiles aren't going to be in the promised land. That's why when it talks about us going to make a sacrifice once a year, back in the book of Ezekiel, we're going to be coming from other lands. And the people that don't come from other lands to worship Jesus and the Feast of Tabernacles, they're not going to have any rain. Won't affect us. We're in a glorified body. Don't have a need for food. <laughs> That's going to be fun. But we'll be able to drink and uh, eat for fun. That's going to be great. Won't that be great? Won't have to worry about, yes, yes. Then you can tell the folks, don't worry, when you get your glorified body, you can look like me too. <laughs> just, just not right now. Yeah, don't look at this now. All right, where are we at here? So what's the last, <laughs> I heard something about hair back there. I did hear that. We, we'll, we'll all have hair. Jesus had hair after his resurrection, and so I'm... I'm hoping we're all going to have hair when we get there. It's going to be glorious. Maybe white as wool. I don't know. Isn't that what John saw in Revelation? And Daniel? I'm not getting a mullet. Yeah. Just, yeah, 80s called one of my mullet back. So I think God cursed me because I permed my hair too much. He said, I made it straight, and then you want to do that? Yeah, you're done. You don't need hair. Anyway, what's the seventh covenant? Jesus talked about it at the Last Supper. This is the blood of the... New Covenant. Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which will be shed for many for the remission of sin. And so the new covenant is ultimately, it was made to the nation of Israel first. And you can find that in Jeremiah 31, 30, 31, 31, 31 to 34. Um, he talks about that. He said, in the times in the future, I will... Uh, give you my spirit and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you'll keep my commandments. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Uh, so in the new covenant, pr God promises to forgive sin and there'll be a universal knowledge of God. Jesus came to fulfill uh, the, the Mosaic law, Matthew 5, 17. I've not come to uh, disregard the law, but I've come to fulfill it, uh, create a new people. Um, this would be the church Matter of fact, uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given, uh, that's when the church began, and it ends the day of the, um, the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled at the rapture. And so then we see God's final dealing, and this is what Romans 11 talks about. God will deal with his people again, and then all of the ones that are going to be saved are going to be saved, and uh, we go through all, all of that. So we see that we are not Israel. Um, Israel is not the church. We're all grafted into one olive tree. God had one plan, one purpose, and God worked it out different ways, but he's still God and he doesn't contradict himself, nor does he lie. And so we're grafted into all those promises. Some of those were for Israel. Uh, some were for us. And so uh, we are partakers of some of the unconditional promises like the kingdom, the new covenant, uh, matter of fact, the Old Testament was saved the same way. How are people saved in the Old Testament? By faith in who? God. What about people before Abraham? How were they saved? Faith. Faith in who? 
Okay, how was Adam saved? By faith. Uh, faith in who? Okay, so here's my next question. 1446 B.C., Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. It's called the Law of Moses, the Law, uh, the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of Moses. So how did Abraham get saved if Moses hadn't written the first five books yet? Okay, whatever revelation has been revealed, you are responsible for. So from the beginning of creation, we have creation. After the fall of man, and this deals with the dispensation of conscience, uh, because after the fall of Adam and Eve, then they were given a conscience, knowing good and evil. And so everybody from them, that's part of the curse actually, everybody from them now has a conscience, knowing good and evil. Um, so the idea is that creation, conscience... Uh, know that there's a creator, and whatever has been revealed to Abraham, he was responsible for. And so, yes, God specifically talked to Abraham. Now, if God walked with Adam in the beginning, now you have oral tradition. Oral tradition is going to go from every uh, parent down to the grandparent, because that's how they told the stories. So when Noah walked with God, and he was upright before him, and he saved him on the ark, after they got off of the ark, everybody would have known... It, all of the Noah's family knew about God and him talking to them. And so as they had children and children and children and children and children, they would have orally give the tradition of how God spoke to them, who God is, all of that stuff. That's why when God said, go and fill the entire earth, and they did not fulfill that command, um, God caused, when they did the Tower of Babel, God caused the confusion in languages, forced them to spread out. But this is the beauty, and this is why we have a creation and a flood legend on every continent around the world. <laughs> because this was the descendants of Noah and his kids, and uh, when God dispersed their language, they spread out all around the world, fulfilling God's command to, fulf to fill the earth. Um, so when it comes down to it, they were responsible for what was revealed to them. Um, and that's what happens if you, don't, if you suppress that truth. Guess what? Even though you know God, <laughs> you don't know Him as God, and you suppress the truth, and God will give you up, give you up, give you up, till He finally gives you over. And that's where all the other nations come, and so God gave Israel the job to redirect the nations, but they didn't want to do it. So then His judgment came on them too. And it doesn't make God a moral monster for killing Old Testament people that just wanted to do horrible things. I think it's funny now today people want to murder innocent babies in the womb and then do all this atrocities and uh, but when they look at God in the Old Testament for trying to stop evil they call him a moral monster. That's, no sorry it's, it's hypocritical when they think of it that way. All right those are the seven covenants from Genesis to um, the Gospels and the new covenant is ongoing because the same people will be saved in the tribulation period because the Jews, tribulation period is God's final dealing with the nation of Israel. The Jews understand that they crucified their Messiah and so they're looking back to be saved. When we have the millennium, um, it's not Judaism again. Even though you're going to have the temple and sacrifices and all that stuff, it's going to be a new kind of global system. It's going to be a universal church um, but they'll still have to go to sacrifice, and that's going to point back to Jesus because people in the millennium are going to need to be saved. Um, so you have all these people that are going to need to see Jesus. We look back in the Lord's Supper, the Old Testament animal sacrifices look forward to Jesus, and then tribulation and millennium look back as well. Uh, so they're all going to need some type of idea uh, to know who Jesus was. All right, are there any questions on the covenants? Most of these are God's unconditional covenant with mankind. Well, most of them for the nation of Israel. Uh, but we are partakers of some of them. Any questions? No questions? You want to know the dispensations? Sure? Yes? No? Okay. Okay. Seven dispensations as they're given. One is the dispensation of innocence. 
This is where Adam and Eve were created, uh, innocent of any good or wrong, uh, good or bad, uh, any wrongdoing. They were created uh, in the image of God. And so the dispensation of innocence ended when they failed and sinned. As a result of sin, the dispensation of conscience came into play. Uh, and every person after them were given a conscience, knowing good and evil from birth. Conceived in sin, knowing good and evil from birth. And so this is where you have uh, the responsibility to uh, believe in a moral lawgiver because now it's been given, passed down through the bloodline of the Father uh, because Jesus was born of a woman. But, of course, that was prophesied Genesis 3.15 that the Father would have no dealing with it. Third is the dispensation of human government. When did God create human government? Genesis. Judges. Genesis. <laughs> oh, I, I'm telling you when God created human government. <laughs> yes, the judges were part of that human government, that, but that was specifically for the nation of Israel. In Genesis chapter 9, when Noah stepped off the ark, what did he tell him? If man sheds man's blood, then by man shall his blood be shed. That's no longer God governing the world. It's man governing over man. And so when he stepped off the ark, that was given to every son and their wives. And as they had children, and we talk about the Tower of Babel, as Noah's descendants over, I think, uh, 325 years from the flood to the Tower of Babel, and all these people are being created. When God separated them and they went all around the world, there was a human government in every continent around the world because it was designed by God, and God had created that. So um, the Old Testament before Abraham, you have the law of Hammurabi and all of this stuff was basically given uh, based off of God's commands. Um, matter of fact, in the law of Hammurabi, it was illegal to have homosexual or lesbian marriage. <laughs> it's been that way for thousands of years until you come to New Testament times. But anyway, that's the law of human government. Dispensation of promise. This is the one that correlates with Abraham. Uh, dispensation of law, this is the Mosaic law. Dispensation of grace, this is what we live in today. This is the new covenant, uh, which is in his blood. By what you are saved? Through? By grace you are saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's an unconditional covenant. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. But you still have to receive that free gift. Uh, then the dispensation of the millennial kingdom of Christ. Uh, this is yet to be fulfilled, and of course we're waiting on, uh, this is actually part of the Davidic covenant that comes in, where David is going to, uh, his descendants are going to restore the kingship uh, of Israel, it's going to be in Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to rule and reign with a rod of iron, he's going to rule the world though, that's going to be the beauty of it, he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron, so this is the dispensation of the millennial kingdom of Christ. You got to be careful because a lot of people um, add to these dispensations, don't get caught up in all that. Don't get caught up in covenant theology. Just get caught up in the promises of God and what you're partakers of. Which ones apply to you and which ones don't. That's all you have to worry about. But uh, I say dispensationalism because in 1904 uh, or 1909, I forget the exact date, but if you know anything about the Azusa Street Revival out in California, this started a big uh, charismatic movement among faith healers. Um, and different types of denominations, and they use that as one of the dispensations that God has created, uh, which we don't agree with in our doctrine here at Mission Point, uh, but a lot of people do, and then they think that God is creating new dispensations where he's continually testing people. All right, not that that was confusing enough. Any questions? All right, covenant theology. So it either goes back to the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, or you're a part of the new covenant. And so we got a better covenant. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled everything that would put us to death. And so praise Jesus for that. Any questions? Yes. He 
He did. <laughs> that, that's a good question. That's a very good question. God don't need reminded of anything. Um, it, it is for him, but it's also for his people to be reminded that God keeps his promises. And this goes back to um, Abraham when he was to sacrifice Isaac up on the mountain. And so he says, Abraham, Abraham, you know, don't, don't sacrifice your son, for now I know that you'd be faithful to me. Well, God already knew that he was going to be faithful. He knows the end from the beginning. It wasn't for him. It was to show Abraham where he was at in his walk with the Lord. God is always going to be faithful. And that's the point is because, and how I tie this together with that, Abraham, when the day God called him out of his father's house to a land he was going to give his descendants, he never left his dad's house. And so he always was one step behind in his obedience. And so when God promised him, I'm going to make a great nation, I'm going to make your name great, I'm going to do all these wonderful things, I'm God, trust me. He didn't trust him. Trusted him a little, a little more, a little more. Then when he went into Egypt, he told Pharaoh that uh, Sarah was his sister, <laughs> not his wife, so he didn't die. So if he would have really trusted in God, he would have understood God's promises and God cannot lie. And so the whole point of the rainbow and the story of Abraham, I'm tying these together, is that we just need to trust God because God is faithful and he will fulfill all his promises. So even though that was for God, it's also for us to remind us God is faithful, that he will not do what he promised he will not do. Because at the end of it, that's where Abraham comes to. He is so strong in his faith. That's why in Hebrews 11, he's in the hall of faith. It says that he knew one of two things. Either God was going to raise him from the dead in a resurrection, or he was going to give him a new child, 130 years old by this time. And so he said, one of the two, I know God can do it. I'm going to just be obedient. Does that answer your question? I mean, I know it doesn't, but, but it does. It, it gives us the opportunity to understand God's faithfulness. And that's why it's a reminder to him for us. It's actually reminding us for him. <laughs> Uh, not particularly. The rainbow only has certain colors, and uh, the LGBT flag only has, uh, doesn't have the f exact number that uh, the rainbow does. So it's, it's irrelevant, and it's also in the sky. It's not a straight across, and so, you know what? It doesn't really matter. Uh, God knows, and that was for God. So um, you can take the other. God is not mocked. <laughs> Whatsoever man shall sow, that shall he also reap. And Romans 1 says that that is, uh, that is God's um, wrath on people that have rejected the knowledge of God. So we just see that uh, being played out.